this morning I want to uh, kind of bring in a little bit of, um, I feel, a uh, revelation about how we actually get to the next level. And um, I hope I can debunk uh, quite a bit of lies and put truth in there. And hopefully, um, as we build a kingdom, we're going to become better and better at it. Well, one of the parts I want to read in is Matthew um, uh, chapter 13. And I want to read the verses, and I want to try to build a little bit of foundation, then we're going to go into those verses. So um, I'm just going to read this. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 through for, uh, 58. It's coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed when they, where they did this man, where did this man get his wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, John, Simon, and Judas? And aren't all these sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. I want to propose to you that it starts amazing. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people and the synagogues, and they were amazed. And we're going to talk about what the, actually the word amazed actually is defined by. And then we're going to process this towards the end where it says that he couldn't do anything in their town, paraphrasing. I want to propose to you that there's places in this world where you can go and you have an amazing encounter, you have miracles, and then you have the same people in a different place and a different setup and there's nothing. I want to propose to you there is Jesus, the Son of God, who actually is not able to do anything in this particular place, but in other places, He heals everybody. And if we want to learn, I think there's a big deal about trying to figure out what are the barriers that actually hinder God from doing things, because there are. I believe that God is all-powerful and He can bully through anything, but He always gives us free choice. And even in a perfect world, He gave us two trees to choose from. One is the fruits of life, and one of is the uh, good and evil. We always have a choice. And it's not that God is not wanting to. It's not that God doesn't have a desire. It's not that God is not powerful enough. It is that He chose us, you and me to do something amazing. And so I want to ponder on that a little bit and walk this out with you a little bit. I feel that the, um, the study of the commission in Scripture is very clear, and I feel that it's been given in the primary uh, um, writings of the Bible, which is in Genesis. And you talk about Genesis chapter 1, 28, where it says something very interesting. It says, God blessed them. He said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. There's three things that are actually saying that he blessed them. He said to them, multiply and he said to them uh, to subdue it. The problem is that we read that and we kind of get enamored with the idea that, oh, this is fantastic. This is the story of how, how God started the, the world, and uh, we kind of just are enamored with the thought of it. But when we actually hear the commands and the scriptures in that, that actually designs us into this world in such a very amazing fashion, then when we believe that that's what we're supposed to do, everything changes from a person that just basically is alive and well and rides down a river to one that actually climbs a mountain and conquers it. And I want to propose that we are actually the people that, that are supposed to uh, climb and conquer. And so I feel that it says to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. I believe that if it's supposed to be multiplied, that means we are supposed to have children. And those children are imprinted by us. And they again have children. And those children are imprinted and they again multiply. Why is it so important in this world that identity gets passed down from, from the parents and identity gets actually passed down from the father? I want to take a little rabbit hole uh, because I, I do believe it's important. You have a lot of problems in this world. And in the last hundred years, 
when God was taken out of our consciousness and we were told that we were just an actual explosion of some uh, cells that actually made it in some way to what you are today, it would be irrational to believe that evolution actually works to the point where now it gives you consciousness. Evolution cannot give you consciousness. Only perfect design can. Only supernatural design by God can give you that. And the world is, 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 is actually a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde because one moment they tell you you're animals and the next moment tell you you're humans. One moment they say you're driven like animals and let the tough survive and this is how we've uh, had evolution over seven billion years, that would be true. And then the next moment they say we have to make a differentiation between good and evil which is total dichotomy of what evolution is. Evolution is to let the toughest survive. It doesn't say let's be kind. It just means the toughest survive. Why do we, we suddenly, we tell all of the, we've made such a big deal in the early 1900s, we made such a big deal in the 50s and 60s to tell everybody that God is dead, that God doesn't exist, and we took the reason of your existence, the reason of your identity out, and then we're asking you to actually behave godly. We take God out, but we're actually telling you to behave godly. Does that make any sense? He says for us to be fruitful and multiple, that we're blessed. Blessed by who? Blessed by God. And then it says that we're supposed to have children and tell the children and tell our kids as kids as kids consistently what God has been doing. And with that, we're supposed to displace that darkness that actually at that point inhabited the land. How do we know that? Because if everything in this world would have been perfect, he would have not said subdue. Are you with me? He says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. There's something to subdue. There's something to, to reign and rule over. And it wasn't you and me. It wasn't ruling over us. It was ruling over principles and powers of darkness. How do we do that? By walking in obedience with him, doing that. As we do that, the enemy actually gets displaced. And how what happened, we all know what happened. We gave the key and the authority that we had, we gave that away. And so we live in a fallen world, and God instated, uh, instated the, um, actually the, the plan of salvation. And then Scripture talks about how he got the keys from the enemy and brought them back and gave it to us again. The uh, term subdue actually implies that there was darkness, and subdue is a military term, it means to conquer. It just doesn't mean to just move along, but it means to conquer and displace. So God literally tells us that we're blessed. God says that we are supposed to multiply and what we know and what we live to tell and teach our children so our children's children will live in, a, in an amazing way. And I believe that if we do that, we will actually build the kingdom. The problem is that the church over the last hundred years has believed that we are all just here for a little while, hopefully hold on to dear life, because what we actually really want to do, we want to get to heaven. And we totally no longer agree with the principle that we're actually here in this world to subdue the enemy and to bring salvation to mankind, because that's the command. And so what happens with us, we do this, we have believed that all I want is I want to get to heaven. There's many people that just want to die right now because, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. And the lie that the enemy actually tells you is that you have nothing, nothing to live for. And like we talked about last time, that your vision, as long as I can seal your vision about what you and your purpose you created for, you will give up life. And we've been, we been know that that's the spirit of Jezebel because actually Elijah did the same thing. He said, just kill me now. So we know that's not from God. And we believe that God has given us a, um, a reason to live and a purpose to live. And that's why we're here. So the question is, When we're living our life, do we understand that we're living 
God said in the beginning, he says, you will live 120 years. Most of us give up at 70 or 80. We think that's enough. I hear many people say, I don't want to live to 120. Why, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Like, who told you that it's not okay? Who told you that you're too old? Who told you that I don't want to walk with a cane? Well, then do something so you don't walk with a cane. Eat healthy. Change your habits of life. Change your, uh, your eating habits. Change your habits of what makes your body actually function properly again. And then actually understand that there's been 120 years given by God for you to live. That means there's works created by God for you to do. And he has established that before the foundation of the world. He has told, he's written all your works in the book. Why would you want to get off early? Why do you want to quit the race earlier? Why would it be even important for you to get to heaven? Because you're going to get there at the 120 and the one day. Why is it that you, you know, wouldn't we all understand it's so much more important to do what God has called us to do? To live out our purpose here because we're going to be in eternity with him living purposefully then. Why do we want to shortchange that? What is with us that we don't understand that we're so important that God actually designed us to live in this place right now to displace darkness? Why can't we understand that? Why? It's because the enemy wants to deceive you to think this is a loser mentality. I want to propose to you that we are so important and that our future is so amazing. That's why the enemy is attacking you and telling you and trying to do whatever he can to disillusion you and to disappoint you and always bring up the past. It's funny what people do. Because the enemy has a way how to bring up the past and to condemn you with it. If you look at today's politics, today's world, everybody brings everything up from the past. And I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm not saying it's horrible. I'm not saying anything. But I'm saying at one point we can't live our life from the past. Slavery, I know it's awful, it's happened, it happened, but you know what, let's move on. Holocaust happened, I know, but let's move on. Nazis, yes, it happened, let's move on. Communism, yes, we understand all the atrocities that happened, but at one point, we have to move on. I understand all the, all the things, I get that. But it's not helpful to live constantly in the past because it hinders your future. I believe God has set a very clear standard. And he says, you are blessed. I want you to multiply. And I want you to conquer this world. He says, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to create you, a human, created in my image for you to do it. Because I delight in you. It was not that God isn't strong enough. God could have just snapped his finger and said, okay, Satan, you're done. And all of your people, well, all of the angels that fell, boom, done. It is not even a war. It's not even a contest. But God, in his infinite wisdom, decided to create you and me to do this job for him. And that means we are not leaving the race before it's time. That means I'm going to start taking ownership of how I'm going to live healthily. Not because I just want to be healthy. It's because I want to be healthy to do the things that God's called me to do. I'm going to change my habits because I feel it's important for me to live in a way that I can engage. Because I want to be like Moses, that when I'm 80 years old, I can still trek around. I want to be like Caleb, that at 80 years old, he's going to take over the promised land. He goes, I'm going to go in there, man. And I believe that those of you are older than that, I believe that you can ask God, listen, God, I got it now. Restore to me my strength again because I'm going to live until 120. I'm not going to partner with this. I'm getting older. I forgot already. I don't know where my keys are. I don't know where my glasses are and they're on me. It doesn't matter. That's just the way the enemy wants to discourage you. It's not true. Yeah. God has created a destiny for you to do. And the sooner you actually agree with that destiny, the better it is for the world and you. Because then the works that God has prepared for you to do, you can start doing them. Are you with me? Is that encouraging? So, that is Old Testament. And then it transfers into the New Testament because the disciples' prayer, we find a very important influential moment combining earth as it is in heaven. He says, I want you to bring earth... Uh, uh, um, as, it is, uh, as on earth as it is in heaven. 
In other words, heaven is supposed to mirror earth. Earth is supposed to mirror heaven. It's supposed to be the same. That's the standard. It's not uh, kind of close. It's supposed to be a carbon copy of what heaven looks like. It's supposed to be what earth looks like. Earth is supposed to be looking like heaven. So that's the command that he says. So we have 120 years in our lifetime to live that out, to do whatever we can to start drawing and painting what we see in heaven, to start drawing and painting that on earth. So you may want to take a class of born to create because you think maybe the enemy has told you that you're not creative enough. Well, maybe you want to click into heaven and say, God, how does it look up there? I want to do what is there. I, I don't know if many of you, when I used to uh, be in, in school and cl art classes, is one of the fun things is they want you to paint. You're like, oh, what am I supposed to paint? And then they give you this picture and everybody's just like trying to, you know, draw it just because of what they see. And they're actually... The really gifted people, they don't even have to. They just draw it by hand. And other ones, they take a, a white piece of paper, put it on, then trace it, right? I don't care how you do it. Just do it. Just get better at it. Just get better at it. On earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus was resurrected... So you and I have the keys to the kingdom. So his resurrection power gives us the ability again to step into what was plan A, actually. Plan A was, I'm going to create Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve are going to displace darkness. Then something happened. Okay, then God cleaned up all the messes, and that means he doesn't look in your past anymore, he always looks into your present. And if you're part of this world and always looking in the past, I don't listen to people of the past. It doesn't matter to me. Just move on. But here it is. Here is, uh, here is um, he, he comes in and he says, um, I'm going to take these keys of the kingdom. I'm going to take it away from Satan because I won. And now he takes it back and he gives them to us. And he says, now it's plan A again. And the church didn't get it because they all thought we're going to have to have a rapture. All the evil, wicked people are going to stay. And we're going to go wham, bang, up in heaven. And the sooner I die, the better it is. Lead, let all these losers be here. Well, don't we understand that God loves the world? That means everybody and the losers, the way we judge them. And God says, there are no losers. They're only my children. And I want the whole world to be saved, not just some few. And he wants to give everybody the chance. And he says, I'm going to give them, uh, he announced authority over them. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. That is what he said. That was not a suggestion. That was just, uh, this is what you ought to do. And somehow in scripture today, we find that, well, that sounds a good history, what that was about. But today we decide people need to read the Bible and just believe the Bible and have a relation with the Lord through the Bible and the Bible and the Word and the Bible. That's really tough if you don't have a relationship with God. If you just have the law but not the spirit, you have nothing. Because God didn't create you as just a monotonous human being. He created you as a relational human being, and he's a relational God. And then in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, he says, And after that, Jesus was raised from the dead. They were told, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. There is a huge thing, teaching them uh, uh, to observe all that I commanded you. The church forgot that. It didn't say, come to church. It didn't say, worship me. It didn't say, teach them all the things that I commanded you. What did I command you? Go heal the sick, cleanse the leper, cast out demon, raise the dead. Isn't that what it is? I mean, let's just face it, right? So let's look at the church. How does the church look? How did we multiply our children? How are they multiplied? Are our children doing that? Are we doing that? Did our forefathers do that? When did it stop? Where is it that it stopped? Because it has to start again. I want to propose to you that what I read earlier is 
there's offenses that doesn't let this thing go through. We'll get that in a moment. He told them to teach all their new converts, all that Jesus taught them, and it must include healing. I don't know, I find it sometimes increasing, uh, uh, increasingly frustrated, increasingly frustrating when you have somebody who really needs the Lord and really needs some healing and really has some issues in their life, and you'd really just like to cast out the demon. You'd really just like to just heal them in Jesus' name. You'd really like to give them the godly answer. And, and I, I, I don't mean that in any way judgmental or any way negative, but it's so easy to just say, well, all things works for good, Romans 8, 28. All things works for good for those who love them. I'm not sure how many people are really happy with that verse when they're really miserable. Are you with me? You all look at me like, well, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, isn't that sad? Isn't there something in us that says, you know what, we need to start doing this different, God, because that is not what you commanded us to do. You did not command us to tell you a verse. You commanded us to give him an encounter. You didn't command us to give him a nice verse. You see, we are so, we believe we're so great when we know the Bible. And we have the Bible answer man. And we can tell him all a verse. And I think that's great that you can do that. But verses do not help people to walk. Encounters, healing, helps people to walk. Encounters with healing, cancer, words of prophecy, speaking into their lives and breaking the chains out. That is what helps. The word backs all that up. The word is so important because it backs all that up. But just telling them the word without anything else, what are we doing? It's almost like we're playing this game on TV that everybody just knows, you know, well, what do you think? Oh, that's the answer. Yay, yeah, I got the answer. But the answer doesn't do anything until it brings encounter, until it brings transformation. And the church has been geared up for, for the last hundred years. It's been geared up not to believe in miracles, not believe in signs and wonders, that everything is preordained by God and everything else. And we have our little blocks that we believe, and we are so hard and sometimes now so offended when God says, excuse me, I actually wrote in Scripture something totally different than what we all are reading. <laughs> You're looking at me like, what Bible are you reading, Marcus? Well, the same you are. I'm just getting caught with those verses that actually actually challenge my belief system. Changing the assignment and standard was never God's original plan. It was always, you're blessed, multiply, subdue. It always was that. So let's go to this verse. The word offense. They were offended. But let's go to the first one. It says, coming to his hometown began teaching the people in their synagogue and they were amazed. The word amazed is I'm thunderstruck, astounded, in panic and in shock. I mean, Let's talk, that is the Greek word for amazed. So it's not like, like, oh, uh, that, that's cool. No, it was like, <gasps> I mean, I don't even know how that looks like. But probably something close to be passing out. That's how amazed they were. So when God spoke, it was so riveting, so impacting, so amazingly life-changing, that they were like shocked and in awe of how, What? In that moment when that open heaven was there, it was there. And it says, this is what they did. And then something happened. If you read up, it says, where did this man get his wisdom and these miraculous signs? Suddenly the broadcast shifts. Did God really say? Did God really say that you're not supposed to do this so the moment of deep revelation the way i look at it is this here it is 
God throws out the seed, and, every, the, and it starts falling on the ground. And everybody goes, yes, seed. Oh, my gosh, yes. Oh, oh cool. Oh, my gosh, it's amazing, seed. And the moment it turns to, well, what kind of seed is that? Who entitled him to throw seed? And the enemy goes, ooh, they're not eating. I'm going to eat it all up. I'm going to eat it all up. Now, because it's not there anymore, I'm going to go, well, what on earth? I mean, who made him? And let's put it practical. Well, all these years, I never heard that we need to be like Jesus. I mean, I know we have to be like but I don't think it was believed like that. I think I just had to come to church, sit there, and you know, or I have my personal relationship with God. I don't need church. I can just be by myself. I don't need that. I mean, as long as I believe I'm saved, you know, like, what do you want? I mean, I'm saved. You know, as long as I come to this building, you know, I'm doing good. I mean, I come. I mean, you guys see me, I say hi, I even go Shandala, and I go, praise God, and I raise my hand, you know, and, you know, throughout the week, I just, you know, pray for my food, and good night, and bless you when they sneeze, I mean, that's all really good, right? That is not the Christian walk that God had asked for us to do. I don't know what that is, but that's not following Christ. That's, I don't know what that is. And this is not supposed to be a message to make you feel uncomfortable in a sense that, oh my gosh, I missed it. This is supposed to be a message that's supposed to come out inside of you because the Spirit lives in you and go, yes, I want to do what He called me to do. I don't want to do this dog and pony show because this is not what I'm called to do. I'm not to do a dog and pony show. I'm supposed to do kingdom. That's too radical. That's like crazy stuff. Like he's talking. Demonic broadcast begins to tear down. And you have it in your own life. When you don't like what people say, you start going, who do you think he is? If they're younger than you, you go, <laughs> what do you know? You're 10 years younger than me. And sometimes we're that stupid. We go, you're a year younger than me. What do you know? Have mercy on us, Lord. Please. Mercy. Okay. We tear down people. Our hearts quickly turns around to doubt, rational, earth-thinking flesh. You can't be that smart. You either cheat it or something else happens. I don't know, but that's not you. Oh, yeah, I'm that awesome. Have you ever seen four-year-olds play the piano like nobody else can? What do you think that is? That's God in them. That's called a gift. Oh, it can't be true. It must be Photoshop. This is how we are. We discard the, the supernatural totally and completely. We just go, that doesn't fit into my little box that I know. My box. You know, the people who actually became so amazing is the people who were in those boxes all by themselves that everybody thought were loonies. Edison with the light bulb. Everybody thought he was the biggest loser there was until it worked. And today you go, praise God for Edison, man. We have lights. The miraculous was present because they actually says, these miraculous powers, that means there's miracles present. And they discount them. Where does he get this wisdom? That means the way he talked was so amazing. And this miraculous power. So suddenly they're like totally frustrated with him because how dare you we're so confused with what you're doing because it doesn't fit into our grid, what you're doing. It doesn't fit. But actually, God gave him new wine, and it wasn't going to fit into the old wineskin. The miraculous was present, but they started getting inspired by the rational instead of the supernatural. We like to be rational. 
Well, let's think about that. Oh, boy. Anybody wants to start thinking about that? I think, you know, loses right there. Well, are you asking me to be dumb? No, I'm asking you to be full of faith. Well, how does that look? Well, that means, like Peter, you get out the boat. That was really stupid. No, that was the smartest thing he ever did. Every miracle that happens in the Bible, the guy that had to wash himself seven times, he goes, I'm not going to wash myself seven times in a dirty river. Um, all right, then you're just going to have leprosy for the rest of your life. Well, I think it's stupid. I can't believe it. I'm so offended by him that he didn't come up and open the door. He just told his servant, go wash yourself. I mean, I'm bigger than that. I'm... All right, go. You can be offended all you want. You don't get nothing. When you're offended, you got zero. And then the little guy who runs the horses and shoveling, you know, he turns around and says, hey, master, what do you think? What do you have to lose? A 50-50 chance, dude. Go on, jump in the dirty river, man. And what do you have to lose? So after his hot head kind of got hotter because of the sun, he goes, <laughs> all this trip for nothing. He goes, okay, well, okay, I'll try it. And guess what happened? He got cleansed. No more leprosy. I'm just saying. When we start rationalizing, that's stupid, that's never going to happen, you already, right there, you're offended. You're offended at the supernatural. Then they said, I asked this, is the carpenter's son? Isn't this his mother? So now we're getting really excited because, yeah, he is this and he is that. We know all this stuff about him. We, all, we know all this past about him. He could never be the son of God because, I mean, come on. That's about as stupid as it can be. We know everything about you. Right? I'm just saying. So we are really rational now. There's no way you can do that because I know who you are. I know where you came from. And surely you're not going to be that. And then Jesus' word says this. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. The word honor means despised. The word honor, this, without honor, without honor, those two words means despised. Unrecognized. Reproached. And after that, he says, he that did not do many miracles because of their lack of faith. Their lack of faith did not produce miracles. I believe the world is indignant about who Jesus is. He causes them to stumble. In the early 1900s, we were so indignant about who Jesus was and the Bible was and the Christians were and everything else. And next thing you know, we take Jesus out of the school system, out of everything. We take God out of the whole world and actually make secularism, which basically means there is no God. And then we wonder why everybody goes nuts. We wonder why everybody's looking for purpose and reason in this world. We wonder why alcoholism is nuts. We wonder why drugs are crazy. We wonder why psychopaths are running all over the place. We wonder why sex is all over the place. We wonder why people want to do, have sex with all sorts of things. And we wonder why all these people are looking for identity left and right, trying to find out I'm a man, I'm a boy, no, I'm a cat, I'm a donkey. Whatever it is, there's 24 definitions of gender right now in America. 24! I don't even know them all, but there's 24. Why? Because we don't know who we are anymore. Because somehow evolution started bursting us forth, and now I don't know what, what arm am I, the chimp arm or the pig arm or the horse arm? Which one am I? And then when we behave like that, what they're told us, we behave like that, then suddenly go, I can't believe you're doing that. Well, you told me I come from dirt. You told me I come from the monkeys. The monkeys do weird things. I mean, you told me my, my, the monkeys are my forefathers. I'm just still in the pre-evolution state that I'm still doing weird things. Why are you punishing me? 
It's the tough world survive, isn't it? You know how, how ridiculous it is what they're telling us? It's all engineered by, by the enemy. Satan is all engaged at. And we're falling for it if we partner with that stuff. It's nuts. God, this is the season of awakening. This is a season where God is saying, I'm calling back. What I, I'm going back to plan A. Subdue the world of all the principalities and powers because I've given you all authority. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 41, that the prophet, if we receive the prophets, we'll receive the prophet's reward. If we receive the prophet, we will receive the prophet's reward. If we believe what God says about us, we will get that. So he began to rationale, right? So what causes men to stumble on offense? I want to walk through this a little bit. What causes men to stumble and have an offense is, I've made up my mind. I've made up my mind what I'm going to believe. That means I'm no longer teachable. I, I believe I know what it is, and I know what it is, and I know what it is, and I'm no going to teach me anything because I already made up my mind. The reason why I make up my mind is because I'm insecure, and I cannot handle somebody having a different opinion than me. So they had to, I've made up their mind, and that's why they were offended. I make up my mind if my identity is wrapped up in my old self. I'm offended if I is very high in my list. If I is the priority, then offense comes really quickly. I identify it by my old self, and this is how we used to do it. This is what we used to do. And I can't believe you're doing it this way now. And I'm not really good with change. How many people say, I don't like change? If you don't like change, then you're not for prosperity, and prosperity is what God promises you. Revelation is prosperity. Visions are prosperity. You don't like change? All it is is you're partnering with a broadcast that is not of God, period, end of story. I still don't like change. Well, ask God to make you excited about change. Are you all here? Good. Sometimes I'm offended because I'm just not wise and I don't trust others. I don't trust others. That's called bitterness. The reason why you don't trust is because you've been hurt and now you just close the, close the door and say, I'm not trusting nobody. Everybody's a liar. Everybody is, uh, well, I, I never, never said that, but you act like that. Well, uh, because I, I don't trust you, because you, uh, because, okay, it doesn't matter to me. Don't trust me. It's okay. I'm not offended when you don't trust me. Absolutely, I'm not offended at all. But I know for myself, if I don't trust people, I don't grow. End of story. I'm always going to be at the level where I am. If I don't trust, I'm not growing. End of story. So, the other thing is uh, what holds you back is um, when you are offended, what makes you offended is if you have bitterness and hurt in your life. And if you have an orphan spirit, that means you don't believe that you belong. If you don't believe, believe you, that you belong, then you're not going to believe and behave. Everybody wants to belong somewhere. Everybody wants to be, accept me the way that I am. And the reason why stress is in this world is because we still have not learned how to love in such a way that people don't feel afraid. Perfect love casts out all fear. So when I love people, they come. And it's interesting because in my life, the way I deal, what my position is and my identity is in, in, in the what God has given me, a lot of times that's, that's the thing that is, bothers me the most and hurts me the most is because I truly want to love people. But when people somehow don't feel that, I always take it personal. What else do I need to do? What else do I need to do? How can I love them better? How can I love them better? And I believe I cannot love anybody better if they don't want to be loved. If they don't want to be loved, I cannot love better. Jesus loved everybody and the sinners gravitated to him. They loved him. Why? Because they wanted to be free. They wanted to change. But the others who had made up their mind, they rebelled against him. They were offended against him. And so we have to understand, yes, I try to love people as best as I know how, and I'm not that great at it, but I'm still trying. And yes, sometimes it's my fault because I'm not loving yet great. But sometimes it's also yours. 
because you don't want to be loved because you don't feel like you belong and you blame everybody else but I feel jealous of other people I'm offended I feel jealous wow where did I get that good of a revelation if I now encourage them then I they're gonna think they're better than me and I don't want to do that I don't want people thinking they're so awesome I want people thinking I'm awesome None of you ever thought that way. I totally get that. Just the weird other people. How do we encounter? And how would change that? How do we change? How, what can we do practically to actually influence people in the right way? I think number one is through honoring. Now it's no longer about me, but it's now about everyone. How do I honor people? How do I honor where they're at? How do I not judge them because they're somewhere? How do I start communicating not in a judgment, judgmental way, but in a loving way? How can I open my heart to them that they understand that I love them? That's honor. The other way how I can build, uh, uh, break down their offenses is by loving them and through anointing. You can be as gifted as all get out. But gifting doesn't change people. It's the anointing of God to trees, And the anointing actually means oil. When I get oil on people... It stays on them and it rubs all over them. Gifting has no oil, but the anointing has oil. And the anointing on you will get you all oiled up. So you can be as gifted as all get out. You can have amazing rallies where thousands of people come to you, but in the end, they came and they left. But when you have anointing, you rub oil all over them, and the oil changes them. It's the Holy Spirit. Don't be impressed just by gifting. I can influence through obedience when God asks me to do the tough things, the things that are, I'm so sorry I hurt you, even though you didn't do anything. But they feel hurt by you. So I'm so sorry that, that I hurt you. That's not my intention. Sure, I give you this. And it's the most favorite thing you have, and you really don't want to give it, but you give it anyway, because God said so. Suddenly, their offense breaks down because you prove them by not just giving them a verse, but you prove them by life, that there's different people out there that know how to love right. That's how we break down offenses. Through God's perfect timing, hold your tongue until God says to say something. So many times people get hurt by what we say because the soil is not ready to receive the gift. So many times we are more into fixing instead of into walking alongside. We are so excited. Just tell you the <laughs> pat answers right there. That's what we want. Just get it, doggone it. But walking alongside people is the tough one. I don't want to be your friend. I don't want to talk. I don't want to walk with you. Just get it. And sometimes we like just like, you know, give me. I'll give you 100 bucks if you just don't bother me again. We treat the, pair, the people that we don't like, we treat them like our children. Here, I don't want to spend time with you. Here, buy an Xbox. Here, go to play soccer. Here, do ballet. Here, does this because I don't know what to do with you when you're together. I just don't connect. But so hopefully you'll find that I value because I send you away with money. Right? And I have to say, I'm totally for soccer, ballet, whatever you want to do, it's fine. But if your attitude in you is, I'm afraid to have a relationship, I, I don't know how to connect, so I'm going to connect with finances, it shows in your life. Because the way you do life is not different at home than it is everywhere else. It's actually, you may think you're fooling everybody, but you don't because you're not that powerful to change your core values and your faulty belief system inside. It's impossible to change without an encounter with the Lord that actually changes that and actually releases those chains. So the way you do life here is going to be the way you do life. Well, I'm different at home. No, you're not. I'm different at church. No, you're not. Using words of knowledge, using God's wisdom and counsel, showing the Father's heart through supernatural power. 
These are all amazing ways how to actually show the love of the Father, how to actually breathe that. Displacing dem demonic uh, forces through obedience, because some of them you don't have authority over, but you can displace through obedience. Are you here? They have authority because somebody else, somewhere down the line, a territorial spirit or something has, has placed that there. But you can do something to displace them. You may not have the power to tell them to get out of there, but you have a power by just behaving differently. And they will be displaced. You're never the victim. Never, ever, ever the victim. You're always a conqueror. You're always the one who has it. Always in power. Always in control. If you desire. Because that was plan A. Plan A is you're in charge, you're in control. And God gave you the keys so you are in control. Don't believe the lie that you're not. Are you still with me? So God says, Ephesians 4, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful to build people up. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you have sealed. The word grieve means to pain, to grieve, to basically childbirth. It's the amount, a huge amount of pain. The Bible says in Romans 8, 6, says the mind of a sinful man is death and the mind controlled by the spirit it gives life. I want to propose to you that if we are people who live in a place where we are not received and people are offended by the message that we have, I believe that's why when you go to conferences or go to different places, there's an open heaven, and you find healing there, which I believe you can actually, theoretically, you can find it everywhere where there's no offense. But when you're offended, and we are offended at people who give us words, we're offended at people the way they do things, every time you have an offense about something or something, you're going to have a ceiling over you, and you're not growing anywhere. And it's very evident because even Jesus, when he was there, he couldn't do anything because people were offended at him. I want to propose to you that the reason why this world today struggles still in such a way is because people have an offense to Jesus. It's not that Jesus doesn't want to do the good. But we believe that God is a good God. We believe that wholeheartedly. And God wanted to do in his hometown what he did in all over uh, Judea and, uh, and, and Jerusalem. He wanted to do all that, but he couldn't because there were offended people. I believe that God wants to do the same thing here, but sometimes we are so offended still at the way he does it, through whom he does it, how he does it. Why doesn't he do it this way? Why doesn't I believe offense is what keeps everything from actually progressing. And there's a, something that has to change in us that we have to say, you know what, I need to stop being offended. And maybe that needs to take some time to really take ownership because I'm running and walking around as an offended human. I'm offended at God that he did it that way. I'm offended he gave me my nose. I'm offended he didn't give me any, enough hair. I'm offended he didn't give me a better voice. I'm offended he gave me that gift. We're constantly walking around offended instead of accepting and believing who God made us to be and rejoicing in who he made us to be and then going forward building with brothers and sisters the kingdom of God that he's called us to do. The stone of the builders rejected has become the capstone. Psalm 118, 22. I'm no victim. I'm no victim. I'm a warrior walking forward and they're shooting at me, but I'm surely not a victim. If I'm a victim, is I don't know what I'm doing here. And they, I don't know. I was just walking and they just hit me. I, it's so unfair. No, you're not just walking. You are a warrior. You are a warrior of God. You're a child of God walking forward and you're being hit because your destiny is so amazing. That's why you're being hit. Not because you're a victim. That's the, that's the bag he's selling you. Just give it back to him. Say, I'm not going to take that anymore. I'm not doing that. I'm not a victim. That's why he spent so much time tearing down your identity. The stone the builders rejected in Matthew 21, verse 42, the definition means it's rejected after testing. The sad part is they had the miracles. They had the powerful signs and wonders. They had the wisdom, and they still rejected it because they walked it through earthly wisdom. It 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household, having built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Children have children, children's children, children's children. There it is again. The prophets, the foundations of the people before us, we're building on their foundation. We're building on the same foundation, not on different, on the same foundation that they built upon, we're building upon, and we're bringing the kingdom of God. Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, that's who we're following. We have to break down the offenses in love, and we'll have to change the atmosphere, and how do we influence? Our identity is basic, is God's purpose for us. That's your identity. Many of us don't, everybody wants to be a David, right? I want to be David. I like to be David. I like to be in charge. I like to be the king. I like to be the king. I think everybody just wants to be, you know, I want to be David, David, David. I just want to be David. Well, what about Jonathan? How many of you are ready to be Jonathan's? How many are ready to be Jonathan and say, you know what, I'm going to give my life for you to be amazing? I'm going to give my life for you to be awesome. Because my identity is based upon what God created me to be, not what the world wants. And you know what? There's many Jonathans in this world who wants to be Davids and it's never called to be David. The only couple are called to be a Jonathan. And be Jonathans. And let me tell you, there's so many Jonathans that are going to get actually more allocated than the Davids are. Because you lived out your purpose. And you did an amazing job because the person that you were supporting, the King David, you actually gave your life like Jonathan. You gave your life like Jonathan did. I want to finish with this. If this um, allows me to finish it. I know I'm late, but I want to finish this. What do you want to be? A David, a Jonathan? You want to give me that handheld mic because this is driving me. We have to start walking from acceptance towards acceptance. We have to walk from acceptance, not towards acceptance. Then we can be anything we want. Then it doesn't matter if we're Jonathan or David's. We, can, we have to walk from identity, not towards identity. Then we can be anything we want. Because everything that God told us to be, we will be. And I want to encourage you with this. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we're surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. I want to propose to you that there's Moses, Elijah, David, Samuel, all the great men of faith, Samson. They're all up there in heaven. They're on the stands, and they're seeing you, and they're saying, Yes, you can do it! They're cheering you on. They said, I've been exactly where you are. I've struggled with the same thing. But I want to tell you, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. They have the pom-poms. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. They're cheering you on. You're not alone. And if you ask God, he will show you in the heavenly realms that they're cheering you on because they all want the will of the Father. And the Father says, you're blessed. He says, multiply and subdue which means conquer in a military form. That means we're conquering the world. Not from ourselves, but from demonic forces and powers. And we're giving freedom to the world. Fulfillment is the realization of God's dream through the cooperation of those made in His image. I want to finish with this. Um, these are plants at the prayer house, and the Lord just showed them to me um, a couple days ago. And um, this plant over here, they all were planted at the same time. But you can see this one is a lot bigger than this one. Than this, one. this one is basically the same size that it was planted three years ago. And I want to propose to you what the Lord said to me. He says, Mark, is this the deal? Either we move into the sun... And we do what, you know, we position ourselves in the place where God is doing amazing things. And we grow with that or we stay saved. You know, we, we got here, we're saved. But, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm thankful I'm in heaven. Or we say, you know what, God, yes, I want to have the new wine. I want to drink the new wine. I want to do that. I want to actually do what you've called me to do. And we're going to grow. 
And I believe the only way to do that, if we actually flow, uh, follow, um, follow the signs of them, is basically they're in a team. They're literally, you can mute the, uh, so they're, they're literally, they're just flying in a team together. And you know that in nature, that's one of the most successful ways how to fly is because it's minimum effort. It's in the slipstream of others. And what Ephesians said, that we're following, we're building a foundation on the past of the prophets. And we are to multiply children's children. And we are following and we're flying and we're building the kingdom. That's how we do it. And what we need to figure out that is God is always good. And when some things are not happening, we don't maybe know it all. But one part that I believe scripture is very clear is if there are offenses there, then God chooses to honor you. If you want to be offended, you can be. But then I can't do anything because it says faith is needed. Faith is what? Sure of what I hope for is certain what I do not see. This task is not possible if we only discover the principles of God and follow them. Living a supernatural life, it's not possible if we only discover the principles of, uh, and, of God and follow them. Heaven itself derives on the presence of God. It's not just doing scripture, but it's the presence of God with you. There's a difference. Our commission is only possible when the increase of the overwhelming atmosphere of the glory of God that increases as we pray our assignment with faith. Those prayers must be followed with the risk necessary to display His will on earth. If there's any confusion on what that will look like, look at how Jesus displayed the heart of the Father in His interaction with the people in need, named by eradicating diseases, tormented, and sin. He eradicated disease, torment, and sin. Jesus Christ is the perfect theology. And it is a privilege to illustrate the same reality that Jesus carried. Jesus declared it when he said, As the Father sent me, I sent you. And that's in John 20, 21. As the Father sent me, I sent you. I want to propose to you that we are sent by God, just like the disciples said. We are sent by God, just like Jesus was sent. Now, we believe that or we don't. I want to encourage you to believe that because that actually tells you that you're awesome and amazing and that nothing is impossible. And maybe you think today, you know what, I'm, I'm not sure, this is nuts. Am I really that awesome? I want to propose to you that you slap that lie away and say to your heart, heart, I give you permission to believe that I am and that you are that awesome. I give you permission, heart, right now to say yes to that you are created in the image of God and yes, that you have everything it takes to do these things. I give you permission, heart, to believe that there is amazing destiny and that your past and our past doesn't define us, but only our future. Heart, I give you permission to see into the heavenly realms and see how everybody who has gone there before us is cheering us on and shouting and yelling and, and just telling, yes, you can do it, yes, you can do it, yes, you can do it. I give you permission, heart, to believe and drink the new wine. I give you permission to believe the new wine that has been poured out. In Jesus' name, amen. So good, so good. Let's just stand. Let's, uh, Father, we just thank you so much for that amazing word. And Papa, thank you so much for encouraging us with that truth. So amazing. With the, uh, as the prayer team comes up, I just want to encourage you guys uh, to not leave this room without an encounter from the Lord. And uh, I, I know that definitely I'm going to walk out of today in the boldness to say, yes, God, I want to pursue signs and wonders. I want to pursue what it looks like to do that. And uh, I just encourage you, if you want to get more breakthrough in that, if there's something um, today that you feel like Holy Spirit's touching you, or if you want to maybe address some of those lies or that belief system that you have, um, I just encourage you to come on up and just take a moment with uh, a member on the prayer team and just say, I want to be uh, free of what this block is. I want to get rid of that fence that we were talking about today um, because God has destined for you to have breakthrough. Uh, he is not, as we heard today, he is not interested in you staying exactly where you are. Uh, we're contending that God wants to do an amazing thing through you. Uh, and it starts by just saying, God, I want to do it. So I encourage you, if that, if you, if that identifies with you, come on up, receive some uh, intercession, some prayer from the ministry team. Also, if you are looking for a healing, uh, 
healing in your body, if you're looking for that miracle that we were talking about, if you're believing that God, yes, I want to have that healing, come on up, get that as well. Um, and last but not least, if you have not experienced what a relationship with Jesus is, it's the most important thing you're ever going to do in your life. And I encourage you to come up and find out more about that and find out how easy it is to say, yes, God, I just want to follow you and to have your life changed forever. You're never going to be the same. So I bless you guys. Have an amazing, amazing week. Uh, don't forget about the um, tent that we're going to be doing um, this uh, week, as you saw in the announcements. Um, my name is Michael. I look forward to getting to uh, talk to you and we get to see you. I encourage you on your way out, find somebody you don't know and say hi to them and make them feel loved and make them feel special. Um, and take them back and maybe get some soup today. We bless you guys and have an amazing, amazing week.